Let's go ahead and get started now, please. One of the privileges and responsibilities of being the president of the American Folklore Society is choosing the invitational speaker during the first year of one's presidency. From all the wonderful folks to choose from, how do you narrow it down? I wanted a speaker who was one of our own, a folklorist. But at the same time, I wanted someone who we don't get, often get a chance to hear from. I wanted somebody who represented the applied dimensions of our discipline, but ideally someone who also embodies our scholarly and creative pursuits. And so it is my honor this evening to introduce Dr. Simon Lichman. Simon holds a BA Honors in English Literature from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and then went on to attend the doctoral program in Folklore and Folklife at the University of Pennsylvania, where Simon and I first met. In 1981, he completed his doctorate at Penn, writing his dissertation on the Marshfield Paperboy's bumming play. After returning to Israel, Simon worked as a lecturer in several universities and as an advisor and folklore consultant. In 1991, he founded the Center for Creativity and Education and Cultural Heritage, which he has directed ever since. The center brings together Jewish and Arab, Palestinian and Israeli communities through multi-generational folklore programs. Simon is also a poet, publishing a book, Snatched Days, and his poems have been included in anthologies and a number of international journals. Considering the events of recent months, not only in Israel, but here in America, Simon Lichtman's discussion of coexistence in education, coexistence education could not be timelier. The title of his address, as you can see, Prayer Carpets and Apricot Stones, How Folklore is Used in Coexistence Education Between Israeli and Palestinian Communities, and its potential application to other multicultural settings and conflict situations. So please welcome Simon Lichtman. Thank you. When, uh, when I got the email from Michael Ann, uh, I thought it was a hoax. <laughs> uh, and then um, I said to myself, well, it's okay. You know, I've made this speech a million times before because I always do whenever I hear, you know, I make that speech, but I never actually thought that I would be making it. So, Michael Ann, thank you. Um, it's true that I... I studied my BA in uh, Israel, and it's true that I then went on to do research, which I began at the University of Leeds, on British folk drama. Um, what, but you can hear from my accent that I, either I've worked really hard, you know, or I'm from somewhere else. Uh, and I am indeed from somewhere else. I grew up in England, in London. Uh, <clears throat> and at some point in my life, I understood that um, I grew up in a traditional Jewish home. You know, I went to the synagogue every uh, Saturday. I absolutely loathed it. Uh, I, Hebrew classes three times a week, I loathed them even more. Uh, but at some point, I realized that, there, that history was a, a, a real thing, a concrete thing, and that I, it wasn't just about stories from the Bible, which made me aware of Israel as something I needed to contend with. So at some point, I did go there. And, and, and kind of fell in love. I fell in love with the, 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 uh, the light, the jostle of people, the idea of peoples trying to live together. Um, and at some point came back, did the BA. What I found I was most interested in, in terms of my academic research in Marshfield on folk drama, uh, apart from the mumming, was what it is that makes people um, do the traditions they do but, but more, how do those traditions work for them? Why, how do the traditions speak for them? What is it, apart from the more obvious um, traditional relationship between past, present, and future, what, what else is it that tradition is enabling us to say about our lives, our current lives, and, and the way that works with our past and our presence? Uh, at Penn, I came across a, this wonderful program which uh, Mary Hufford did in Kramer Hill um, 
who was a folk artist in the school's program. And you can see the shadowy Amy Schumann's back as she's doing research on the Weaver. Sorry, Amy. Um, and, and this program really caught my imagination. The idea of folk artists being found in a community and used in school, having children really look at these people and understand the relationship between education and the things that we do, the things that happen, our culture. Uh, and then the idea of this being translated or rather put into a school system so that teachers had to on some level at least contend with the way acquisition of knowledge works in the informal setting, in the folk setting. Um, and I thought, well, this is something I'd very much like to do. I can see it working in Israel, but that I would need something that lasted longer. In other words, not a project a fest that ended with a festival, say three months, four months, five months, something that could be built between communities and even better, between communities who see themselves and often are in conflict, <clears throat> uh, which is basically the program. And while I was uh, teaching at the Ben Gurion University, I devised the program, that was 1985, and then six years later, uh, I've created the, the center. Uh, in order to run the program and I withdrew from most of my teaching and so at that point I was no longer on the academic track. I, I wanted to work in the field with real people doing real things. Not that I, I have anything against the academy. Dan, I love the academy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, um, I, I would like to, yeah, no, hang on. So, <clears throat> some things that we need to know. We need to know that Israel is a country which comprises of many different kinds of people, but primarily Jews and Arabs. The Jews come from communities all over the world. Um, <clears throat> the Arab communities, the Palestinian communities of Israel come uh, from, from Palestine. They come from Jordan, Syria, and the sur surrounding Arab countries and, and Iraq. Uh, by and large, there isn't a whole lot uh, of uh, um, of opportunity to meet in what we would call natural settings. Uh, of course, there are many Palestinian and Israelis who have long-term and ongoing close family friendships. But I would say that's not exactly the norm. <clears throat> in 1948, when the State of Israel was created, the Palestinian communities were offered a choice between a one school system in which the language of education would primarily be Hebrew, but obviously Arabic would also be one of, uh, you know, a, a language for many of the subjects, uh, or a two school system in which um, the Jews would study in Hebrew and the Arab populations would study in Arabic. And the Palestinian populations at that time chose that option, and they did so because they felt that in that way they could protect their children's culture. It wasn't about, uh, excuse me, It wasn't about not wishing to be together. It was simply that they felt that if there was a, a sort of cultural mix at school, that their own children might lose um, a handle on their own culture. It was a decision was made and that school system was created. Of course, it's created many problems in as much as the children don't grow up together. You know, you, they, they don't know how they... They, they don't watch each other study. They don't play sports together. They don't depend on each other or not depend on each other in the way that you, you do when you're at school. You, you learn those things about people. Um, so the children don't grow up knowing each other or feeling, uh, feeling that, they, that, that they are known. They grow up separate, which means that when we consider the conflict and we consider you know, that process of stereotyping and dehumanization that sadly you know, goes on, um, uh, the, the children, by and large, don't have in their mind people who break that, that rule, you know, people on the other side. They have a, a kind of separation uh, in, in, in their minds in any, in any case. So, you know, it's something that possibly could have been reviewed, but it never was. Uh, the schools that we work with, just to make this clear, we work with both... Uh, is we work with Israeli schools, that is, schools that are situated within the Green Line. The Green Line is that um, border that in 1967, after the Six-Day War, um, on the other side of the Green Line, that's the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip, uh, these are Palestinian 
these are Palestinian territories, which became administered uh, by, these, by the Israeli government. And now, I, I, I'm, this is not a political speech, and my program is not political, so I'm not actually talking politics. I'm just giving you um, kind of pointers as to, to, to where we are uh, in the whole situation. Um, so we work with schools within the Green Line, that is Palestinian uh, uh, Israeli Arabs who have citizenship. We also work with schools on the other side of the Green Line in eastern Jerusalem where most of these people do not have Israeli citizenship but they are part of the Israeli school system in as much as the schools are funded by the Ministry of Education, the Israeli Ministry of Education and um, uh, there is the further complication that some of them uh, have a Jordanian curriculum and some of them have an Israeli curriculum and some of them have the Palestinian Authority curriculum. So the whole thing is very, very uh, convoluted and we work with some of those schools. Um, I just want to read this uh, introduction. It, it goes like this. The majority of these slides show the program before the summer months of localized violence and warfare. But Shocking as this might sound, the death and destruction is part of the ongoing situation and as such, what you'll be seeing from within the 23 year history of my work is as relevant today as it was yesterday, if not more so. And where there has been the possibility of building relationships such as those you will see, there has been hope ignited where before there might have been only desolation and despair. Um, Ravana, my, my wife, is over there. She works in evaluation and she took most of these photographs. So here she is uh, taking these photographs. Um, okay, the program is a two year program. We have one hour per week in each participating school. We pair Jewish and Arab schools. Uh, each school has exactly the same curriculum. Every six to eight weeks, we have a joint activity in which the children meet together. One time your school, one time my school. It's that kind of thing, hosting and guesting. We build those activities around parents and grandparents who come and um, work with the children on aspects of the home culture that the children have been researching in school, in their separate schools. <clears throat> so here we are, let's begin with classwork. Here we are in uh, an Arab village school and we, what we're looking at are dolls. And I think, you know, if you look carefully, you just might see uh, Aladdin's palace. And you can also see uh, Jasmine, well, you can't, but Jasmine and Aladdin himself, they're sitting in front of there. So the children begin by looking at this, what I call a dump of dolls. Uh, we're, we also do teacher training, um, and we work in a teacher training college. So this is the same dump of dolls, but on this slide you can also see the, that there are many handmade toys. So the children are looking at this collection of toys, uh, and they are understanding the relationship between old and new, store-bought toys and homemade toys. Not to say that store-bought bought toys are bad and homemade toys are good, but to say that there is a continuum, that history works as a process, that as time moves, things change. And the children then learn that where, what applies to toys, the realm of game, which they understand so well, also applies to topography, that the system of roadways that they have grown up knowing wasn't always there, that the traffic lights that they are, you know, which they, uh, where they cross, um, wasn't, were, weren't always there. In other words, the world is not ready-made. And they come to learn by talking to their parents and their grandparents, and this is a subtext, they come to learn that people, that is you and me, are part of the process of history, that their parents and their grandparents are part of the process of history. <clears throat> Um, so here we are looking at uh, games. In the first year of the program, and that would be, the children would be fourth or fifth grade. Each child is in the program for at least two years. So typically fourth or fifth grade, fifth, sixth grade. Uh, in the first year of the program, the children work on games that parents and grandparents played in their childhoods. So here we have a Palestinian teacher showing children, showing children, um, how to play five stones. He got so in into the subject that he broke the chalk and started to play, which the children found amazing because this, is a, a, this is, a, happens to be a, an authoritarian kind of a teacher. Um, and I'm going the wrong way. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. We then have the children look at these images, these play worlds. There's the very famous 1560 Bruegel, then there's the not so famous 1930s John Allen, which is a, a painting of 1930s street games in actually a, a, a Jewish part of the East End of London. And on the top, uh, top right, you have a, a, it's described as a Bedouin game. I don't know whether it was originally Bedouin or not, but it, it's called CG. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very complicated game. It's a little like XO and a little like uh, checkers and a little like chess. But instead of three on three, you have nine on nine, and it can go on for absolute hours. The children then study these pictures, and they look, especially at the CG picture, they look at the way in which the play space is constructed, the way in which the play space suits the natural, uh, the, 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 natural uh, the land itself gives an opportunity. They notice how the men have taken off their shoes. They notice how there is no board. What there is uh, is, is um, a kind of board that's etched out uh, in the sand itself or in the, in the soft earth. And they notice that there are these two different kinds of, uh, of colors. In, in other words, they, these men have not bought um, uh, their counters. They've found uh, black, black white stones or sometimes, the children love this, sometimes uh, the sheep droppings are used after they're dry, of course. <laughs> Um, we send the children home then to ask their parents and their grandparents all kinds of questions about the games that they played. Now, I have to confess that nowadays I use a questionnaire. I don't like questionnaires. Um, and the reason I use a questionnaire is because when you're working with teachers, they're looking at the world very differently. And we do work closely with the teachers, uh, the form teachers or homeroom home, home room teachers. Uh, are always with us in the classroom, not because we can't be by, by ourselves, but because the school wants this work to be successful and they understand that the teachers hold the key to the class community, plus the, the teachers themselves gain an in-house in training which uh, many of the schools find invaluable. So the teachers for many years said to me, you know, Simon, we don't really like it when you just tell us what to, you know, what to, what to ask the children. We write it on the board and it's, it's very haphazard. We, we, we need to write it down. So we've written it down and one of the problems is that the children think that they need to give out their answers, you know, in the one or two lines um, you know, on this questionnaire. So I have to say to the children, you've got this questionnaire, but please don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> so they go home and they... Uh, <clears throat> They go home and they ask their parents and their grandparents questions. At this point, in terms of folklore, at transmission, transmission is uh, inauthentic, I would say, in as much as the parents and the grandparents are telling the children things, but they're telling the children things as a, as a consequence of, of homework they're being asked to. However, uh, after not very long, we're told, the whole transaction becomes entirely traditional in as much as the parents take off on story. Uh, and I, I, I stress with the children, and when I train my staff, I, tr I stress to the staff, what we want is the story. Of course we want the information, but we want the story. The children have to understand that that's what's important. So here you have an example of the children coming back with play spaces that they drew with their parents and their grandparents. Um, this, sorry, was a, that was um, an Arab school, and here we have uh, uh, an Israeli school, uh, uh, sorry, a Jewish school. This is uh, the, the, the language that's written there is in Hebrew. Um, uh, wait. The children also will bring things that parents or grandparents might make. So on the left on the left hand side, there are stick dolls. You can actually see in the Museum of Childhood in London uh, a stick doll which looks very much like that. It's not quite as neat, but it looks very much like that, and it's 3,000 years old, and it comes from Egypt. So the, these are uh, very typical Palestinian toys. Uh, this kind of, uh, of, of homework enables children to be really good whether they are successful in school or not, because they don't have to write things down. They can write, they can paint, they can draw, they can bring things, and they can tell stories. They can tell the story that the parents have told them. On the, the second slide is, um, as you can see, it's a, a wire car. In terms then of the transmission of information, this little boy said, you know, my father made this car for me, um, and he said this is the kind of thing they used to make. 
Um, so his father tells him a story. Uh, in the story, the child learns that the wire was borrowed. What does borrowed mean? It means that it was borrowed from fences. Was it on the ground? No, it wasn't on the ground. It was still on the fence. <laughs> so the child is, is in, the, in the school, you know, and he's beaming. He didn't realize his father was a thief. He understood that his father was neat, but a thief, well... Um, <clears throat> Uh, and this is a, a lovely photograph from Stephen Amanda's amazing book. Um, <clears throat> parents might typically send photographs of where they played, where they to have them, uh, and then the children will do their own thing. What I forgot to say when I talked about Penn was, um, you know, coming to Penn gave me a huge privilege. It gave me the privilege to work with Henry, Dan, and Kenny, uh, and also with my contemporary students, you know, like Amy and Anna and Stephen Amanda. Um, John and Sam, Michael and so it goes on, and, and it was a privilege, and it was certainly uh, hugely what, what formed me, what moved me on. <clears throat> so the children now bring back, and the top one is a Palestinian hopscotch court, and it's interesting because the Palestinian hopscotch courts have got names. The Jewish hopscotch courts don't have names. I, I haven't got a clue why, but that's, uh, that's the case. In the middle of that hopscotch course, uh, uh, court, court is written flower, and it might be flower, it might be fire, but this, this time it's flower. And what the children do, they jump around the petals. Um, now we're back to a Jewish school in, in uh, Rumla, um, which is near the airport. Excuse me. Um, and this little boy has just been drawing his, his, his grandfather's hopscotch court, which is the one on the end. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, what on earth would Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob be doing? But they are written in the top of that hopscotch court. Uh, any ideas? What, what would Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob be doing on a hopscotch court? Uh, well, um, if you look at these examples, you have a movement on in, you know, from earth to heaven uh, or to sky. And there are also some French hopscotch courts. I've um, never seen them, but I've been told, where just one tiny section on the top of sky, you have hell. The idea that if you throw your slate or stone too far, uh, and, and anthropologists and folklorists have talked about hopscotch as a movement from, from her earth sort of upwards, whether it is or not. Um, but that's what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are doing there. That's the Jewish version of heaven, you know, the Garden of Eden reconstituted. The children then bring all this stuff into school, all this material. And um, I say, you know, who'd like to write a, you know, draw a hopscotch court? So a child comes out and draws it. All the other class hands up immediately. It's not right. It's not right. So I, I say, what's not right about it? So they come and, and, and they draw. And after a little while, this teacher here, we're in a, a Palestinian school uh, over the Green Line in eastern Jerusalem. And again, uh, these schools are, are very strict. The teacher just basically threw his arms up and said, oh, look, all of you just come and draw on the board. And what the children are learning here is the difference between right and wrong. That when we talk about our tradition, you know, yes, you can get things wrong. Of course, we all know that. Um, but, but, but it's not about right and wrong. It's about version. It's about you do it this way, I do it that way, and these are this interesting because they're both they're both versions of hopscotch. But um, so it's not about right and wrong. And in this way, they're beginning to understand uh, an attitude to the world. It's very important this business of right and wrong. It's very important to sort of. Uh, dissolve those boundaries and have the children understand. Uh, and, and adults, of course, are just as bad. <clears throat> uh, and then the children will bring examples of toys that they played with, uh, they, they played with them when they were younger. We are always told boys will not participate. Boys will not participate. So you can see the Russian babushka dolls uh, um, of this girl who was in, uh, is in fact Russian and she had her dolls and the rest of the class knew she was Russian but they had no idea that that's what she played with at home. You know, it is the logical thing for her to have brought from Russia but suddenly the class is seeing it. So the class are looking at each other now with wonder. They're understanding things. You know, there are, of course, two or three people who go to each other's homes, but outside of that, they don't know that much about each other, nor do they know that much about their own, their own um, you know, roots, if you like. You know, you might say, where did your grandfather come from? They'll say, oh, but here. And then you'll say, well, find out, and you'll find that it's Morocco, or Tunis, or, or wherever. The boys, the picture of the boys is one of my favorite photographs, because these were the, these were the Basha boys. You know, these were the boys who, who you know, they were, they were physically confident and, and, and quite tough. And they brought these 
huge soft dolls. And after the class, they spent the rest of the school day playing with these dolls. So now we're moving on to the activities where the schools come together. I call them joint activities. Um, <coughs> here we have um, on the bottom a group of Palestinian children. I call them Palestinian because they are, again, we're in a, in a school in eastern Jerusalem on the other side of the Green Line. Um, they, they, this community hadn't really had much connection um, with, with the Jewish community, and certainly they had never had such a huge um, sort of um, visit uh, as, as to the, the 40 children who were about to arrive. And these little girls, if, I don't know if you can see, but they have carnations in their hands. Now, we never tell the children how to pay, prepare or what to do. We, we give guidelines, you know, you'll need food, you'll need this, and you'll need that. So the carnations were their idea, and they stood with the carnations in their hands for about three hours, because they got to school early, and they waited and they waited, uh, and then the Jewish kids turned up. Uh, it, it, it's a fantastic thing when you walk into a place which you're, you're anxious about. They refer to Jewish space, Arab space. Going to, an, you know, I, going to another school for a swimming competition in London was, was, could, was, was frightening enough. But, you know, it was another school. What, you know, what are they going to, how are they going to, are we going to end up in a fight? You know, this kind of stuff. And if so, how do we negotiate our way out of it? But see, these guys live in different worlds, especially if you're crossing the Green Line. And um, so the, 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 the anxiety is high, but what overcomes it is the curiosity. They want to know. They want to meet each other. No matter what's happening, that curiosity is, is, is there. And it's um, something that absolutely gives me hope every day of, uh, you know, every day of, this, of, of this work. Uh, and you walk into the school then, and you're confronted by these children who are holding carnations. Or you come, uh, or you come to a Jewish school <clears throat> Um, Palestinian children actually from a different, uh, a different uh, community um, and they're welcomed by a sign in Arabic. Welcome in Arabic. These children have been nervous the night before, they've been nervous the nights before the night before, they've been nervous on the bus, but they've certainly come and the first thing they see are these huge smiling faces. Um, of course behavior and, and when we're talking about children is not as simple as it sounds. Uh, Israelis tend to be rude uh, it's, it, it, they do. It, they don't mean to be rude, and they're not actually being rude, but they're, they're not doing, you know, I was brought up to shake somebody's hand, and when my children's friends come, you know, home, I'd open the door and they'd just walk past me, and, and I would say, excuse me, I'm Simon, I'm the father of the house, it's very nice to meet you. So I have to explain to Israeli Jewish children, you have to show the guests or your hosts that you really want to see them, that you really want to meet them. And they say, what, you want us to look hypocritical? No, I say, I don't want you to be hypocritical. I want you to do something that's called being polite. You know, I, w <laughs> I, I want you to do something that's called, I'm so happy to be here. And they say, well, supposing we don't. And I say, if you don't, if you come into the school in the way that you might come into my home, then the Palestinian children are going to feel that you don't really want to be there. Even though you do want to be there, they are not going to understand that. You have to show it. I have to say to the Palestinian children, you know, Israeli children can be really rude. <laughs> they don't mean to be rude, and they might not make you feel that, you know, you are exactly who they want to see. But believe me, you are who they want to see. <clears throat> um, there is, in the Middle East, always food. Uh, uh, and there are always speeches. And there are always presents. So the, um, the Shalom Salam peace sign was a, a present. Um, <clears throat> and now the activities themselves. So typically, we will divide the, uh, the, place, the, the uh, schoolyard into play stations. And on each play station, there will be one, two, or three parents and grandparents and our own staff. You know, we have a staff uh, of, of uh, four or five permanent staff, and then uh, three, four, and then we have a staff between 10 to 15 for the joint activities. They're freelance staff. 
So the children now, they've got through the speeches, they've got through the food, they feel a bit better. They're not quite as anxious as they were, but they're, they were, but they're still very conscious of where they are. And suddenly, they are in situ situations, they're small mixed groups, and they're moving around the schoolyard, and they have parents and grandparents and teachers teaching them to play. It's quite, it's quite bizarre for them. Uh, so immediately, their tension is being released. You can see then the mothers and teachers teaching the double Dutch, which is not something that the children um, uh, have seen. You can also see the crossover skipping this woman is teaching. Now, that's very significant, that photograph, because she was wonderful, this mother. She knew absolutely everything, couldn't wait to come and play. It's a Jewish mother. Um, you know, I rang her up and she said, yes, she'd like to come. Great, fabulous. When she got to school, she said to me, I'm sorry, Simon, I don't know what to do. He won't let me play. Her child wouldn't let her play. I said, well, um, can, can, can we convince him? And she said, no, really, we can't. So now here, I've got a problem. I'm the facilitator, and I've got, a, um, I've got um, a, an activity which I want to be successful. On the other hand, the last thing I want is for her, ch her son to feel uncomfortable. You know, maybe his mother would be laughed at. He, he doesn't know what it's going to be like. He doesn't know these children. He doesn't know what they're going to be like. So um, I quickly think to myself, I've got to go with the, with the son's wishes. And I say to the mother, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. No problem. You know, pit of stomach drops. Uh, anyway, after about five minutes, the, the, the son walks past me and he says, she can skip. Um, and the reason that, that that happened was because I got the atmosphere right. You know, you've got, you've got to build as far as you can the right atmosphere for the people to relax as far as they can in the situation. It's a blend then of doing your field work, you know, and, and the sensibilities that we learn when we, um, uh, as we learn our, our trade as folklorists. Um, how do we enter communities? How do we read situations? How do we, how do we have a plan which we're prepared to junk if need be? You know, we come with our research questions and we realize they're absolutely wrong, and so we've got to do something else. The something else, in my experience, usually comes from the people themselves who, I've, who, who I'm working with. Um, so here, um, the, the, the whether she could skip or not had to come from the sun. And what influenced the sun was that relationship between the structure that we built and the fluidity, the fluidity that he felt. <clears throat> oh, sorry about this. Um, and there's this game called Elastics. It's got various uh, names. Um, uh, uh, Germany, in, in the sense that that mother has brought her version from Germany. Um, or Hopscotch. And I, I love this particular slide because you can see two mothers were drawing their hopscotch, which comes from Jordan, and the father drawing a hopscotch, which comes from Argentina. The sense then that the school playground, that the games themselves uh, uh, mark out that, that, that conflict, not conflict, but that, that fusion, that fusion of cultures, which can be both frightening, you know, and sometimes, of course, exciting. And <clears throat> games then that the children know and they're learning versions from their parents and their grandparents. The versions they don't know, but the games they do know. Uh, another example then would be Five Stones, which you know of uh, as Jax. And there is a, a Jax there, an, an American mother brought Jax. Um, the Five Stones with Stones is wonderful because this mother said to the children, you're not going to play with those neat little cubes you've got. You're going to play with stones. You're going to learn about the weight of stone, the, 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 the amount of time it took us to find the right stones. <clears throat> um, and there's this game which is made from apricot pips, which um, it's a little bit like marbles. Uh, um, or it, sometimes it's sort of against the wall, coins against the wall. It means, though, that apricot pips were very valuable. You know, you would collect them for a long time, you know, and if you had a good collection, then you were a sought-after child. Here is a game, then, that the children will not know. It comes from England. It's horse chestnuts. It's called Conkers, and we have an English father, then, showing that game. Um, and then there's CG. Now we're looking at games that the children don't know because it's in their generation, they're, they're not played. So they're new games for the children. Um, uh, and here you have an example of um, uh, uh, a game. It's, it's a little like stickball, but there's no ball. So imagine stickball with a chip of wood. 
Um, and that's what this game is. Uh, and it's called various things, and, it, and it, most cultures seem to have a, a version of it. And here, the big picture is of a, a London grandfather who's been playing this game now, uh, he's been teaching the game, and I don't know if you can see, but he, in order to, to play this game, he had to walk around the streets in Natanya where he was living at the time, and fashion a bat and fashion a chip. It shows commitment. The parents and the grandparents are committed to this work. They might not be committed to the idea of meeting Jews and Arabs, but the first stage is the children are asking them questions about their lives. What can be bad about that? And they send messages to us, Go. He sat with me and he asked me questions. I was so, I couldn't believe it. That's the first hurdle. Um, <clears throat> and then when we ask them to come and be part of the joint activities, even if, let's say, politically, they're not too thrilled, uh, they're very often curious and they very often come. In fact, often you find that the people with the most to say about the Arabs or the Jews do come and strike relationships with people, um, family members from the other side and come again. Note that this grandfather, is holding something in his hand. Can you see what it is? It's a cup of tea. He's from London. He's been trying to drink that tea for two or three hours. <laughs> um, or this slide. Uh, again, with these next two pictures, you have the, the sort of tension, if you like, between me as planning a program and me as a, as, as a folklorist uh, under, understanding what I'm being told, or rather me as a folklorist not understanding what I'm being told because I'm me as a facilitator who needs the activity to work. This mother who spoke no Hebrew at all said she'd be delighted to come and teach Seven Stones. And I said, that's fine, you know, we'll be jumping up and down and stuff. And she said, no problem. And she came, now look at her shoes. She came wearing these uh, fantastic patent leather shoes, you know. And I said to her, um, oh, that's wonderful, thank you so much for coming. Would you?" like to go home and change your shoes, maybe you'd like to put on some sneakers. And she looked at me and she said, Simon, I am a hostess today. See, that was more, much more important to her um, was the, the fact that they had these people and she wanted to show just how seriously she took it. More important to me was that she played well. This woman, she played seven stones with her high heels, at, didn't care about getting them scuffed, didn't matter that she didn't speak, speak the language. Um, well, this is a, a great uncle from London. Similarly, um, he, I said to him, so will you play that game Tippy Cat? You know, I've heard about it, I'd like you to play it. And he said, yeah, I can play it, but I'd really like to play Canon. And I said, oh great, Canon's wonderful, which, which I didn't know Canon, I said, it's wonderful. Would you play Tippy Cat? He said, well, I, I, I'd really like to play Canon. You know, and after about five minutes of this, I suddenly said, Simon, you're being told something. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> He played canon and was, again, he didn't speak Hebrew or, or Arabic, and, and he, but, but he did well and it was great. Um, so now, these next two slides have to do with repertoire. And again, the, the kinds of rule breaking, which as a, uh, an academic, you know, I'm, I might think is not the right thing to do, but see, I'm applying folklore, so I'm in a different situation altogether. This is a, a, a London street game. Uh, actually, it's a Jewish game in as much as at the time of Passover, Jewish families would give their children nuts um, and the children would find ways of taking each other's nuts. So they would have this nut box game. Um, <clears throat> and um, it's a game that the children really relate to because you, you throw, um, we play it with bottle tops and they throw the bottle tops into the box and if you, you know, you have a little number and if you're, there's five, you get five. So it's quite a competitive game and they enjoy it. So much so that many of them go out and make, get, make the nut box game themselves and play it. So you have an example of a game from one tradition moving into their tradition. Um, in a sense, un, you know, artificially. Uh, and, and, and this is quite moving because you have this duck, duck, goose, you know, I wrote a letter to my love. Uh, in Arabic, it's tak, tak, takia, and in Hebrew, it's golem um, And uh, they, they often play this game, and what we've discovered many times is that the other language version of the game is adopted by the children, and they play it in their recess at school. We also make traditional dolls, so it could be stick dolls, glove puppets, and we do doll shows at the end of the day. Um, 
Uh, and we do lullabies uh, and dance. It, you, I have to be careful. I don't want people to perform themselves. You know, I don't want, it, for, by folklore, we don't mean a show, of, a display of what you think the other person, you know, um, sees you as. I, I, I refer mostly to home culture, that which happens at, at home. Um, so here you have preparation for lullabies and, and uh, traditional dance, and that's the Debka up there. And the bottom two pictures are playing uh, in, a, in a joint activity. So there's a mixed groups of Jewish and Arab children. Wrong way. Um, uh, you might recognize this character here. We, we, we love guests. Anybody who comes to Israel, please come and visit us. We do love guests. Although Robert talked a lot, you know, he was quite difficult. <laughs> the second year of the program is um, we begin with foodways and we talk about hunter-gatherer societies, the movement from hunter-gatherer societies to people who can be sure of food by growing it or having herds. And the children bring all kinds of information. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, mapping folklore, what does that mean? That means they put flags in showing where their particular pickling tradition has come from. Why pickles? Because most Middle Eastern homes make pickles or families make pickles. So we have to have activities that are, are based on something that's t highly accessible to, to people. Uh, and, and here's a, a wonderful example of versions. So typically, you'll get a load of mothers and grandmothers and, you know, coming in to make pickles. And I see this very often. It's really quite embarrassing. So somebody starts and another mother comes along and says, no, that's not how you do it. You're doing it like that. You have to, you, you, you gotta, you have to use beetroot. Um, so you have to explain to the adults, well, actually, she just, this is her tradition. There's nothing wrong here. Otherwise, they've been invited somewhere and they're, they're, and they're being made to feel sort of rather stupid. Um, <clears throat> in terms of creating the joint activities, uh, you need to think of absolutely everything that can go wrong. And Amanda and Steve and I talk about, you know, we talk about this all the time. You, you, have, to work, you have to work hard on the details, cover every contingency, uh, and, and have plan B and C. Usually it's plan C that you end up going with, because, you know, plan A is gone before you get there, and plan B is a problem. So here I am in Ramla, in a, a Jewish school is hosting uh, an Arab school, and I'm supposed to have 15 parents coming in to make pickles. One Arab mother turns up. So now you've got an Arab mother who could feel really quite nervous in a Jewish school with 70 children. The 70 children aren't even in one place. They're in two classrooms. So there's over there and there's over there. And I'm thinking, how is this going to work? Well, the first thing this woman does, she says, I brought some olives. Where are the stones for crushing the olives? Well, I didn't bring any stones because nobody told me she was bringing olives. So she sends kids off to find stones, which there's always stones lying about, so they bring the stones in. Mother looks at the stones, throws a few out, and says, okay, these will do. And then this woman goes from one classroom to another, commands 70 children in some version of silence. At the end of the day, the teachers in the school, they say, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> The children, of course, do bring the pickles home, as, you know, that ring from fairyland that proved that you really were there. <clears throat> uh, and we work on, on bread. What I really wanted to do was build a pita oven. I had this dream. I found this pita oven in Sterot, uh, and I thought, southern Israel, um, it's been on the news because of the rockets. <clears throat> it's near Gaza. And um, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be amazing if I could get children to build this? And at some point in a, in a school in Rumla, an Arab school in Rumla, uh, I met a mother who made pita ovens, and she said that she would really be happy to do it with the children. And she said to me, and so we built our activity around that, great. I said, so who's going to get the clay? She said, oh, we'll get that, don't worry, Simon. I said, well, what about the straw? We need straw. Yes, yeah, Simon, don't worry, we'll get that. I said, okay. Um, can we meet early? Yeah, she said, don't worry, seven o'clock, come to the school, it'll all be there, and it will give us two hours to prepare before the Jewish kids turn up. No problem. I get to the school at a quarter to seven. Actually, it was half past six. Nobody is there at all. And quarter to seven, nobody. Seven o'clock, nobody. Ten past seven, nobody. You know, in a minute, I'm going to have 
what, 45 or, or, or so children plus parents coming to do this activity. I, had a, a, I didn't really have a plan B. My plan B was play. But still, you know, I, did, you know, and I didn't go out to get clay. Where would I get it from? So at right about half past seven or quarter to eight, the woman turns up with her mother. And I said, great, where's the clay? She said, we're going to get that. I said, who's we? She said, we? Come on. So uh, off we go. Oh, sorry. This is just a slide of a, of a teacher preparing the children, talking about different kinds of pita ovens. Um, so we go to this field, which is on a moshav. A moshav is like a kibbutz. You know, it's a co sort of collective, less collective, but collective. So here we are on somebody else's land, right? <laughs> and they say, OK, Simon, we're looking for black clay. I said, great, OK, black clay. I went, I know this is a picture, but can you see the difference? No, you can't. There is no difference. There was no difference between active eyes on the spot, sunlight. There is no difference between one kind of clay or another. So I thought, all right, I'll pick up the clay. You know, I've been taught how to enter communities and not look stupid. So I picked up the clay. They said, that is brown clay. <laughs> so we, just, you know, we worked out what the black clay was and we, you know, and I said, how are we going to bring this black clay back to the school? They said, well, you've got a car. I said, I don't have any boxes. No problem. They said, no problem. It wasn't their car. So I opened the <laughs> boot of my car, and uh, it all gets poured into my car. <laughs> but we didn't have any straw, did we? No. So we go to another field. So now, here I am with two very obviously Palestinian women walking around somebody else's field, gleaning straw. This is the story of Ruth. You know, I'm Ruth. Boaz has not yet turned up. Boaz does turn up on a tractor. He looks at me and he says, what's going on? I said, well, you see, I'm Dr. Simon Litchman from the Ministry of Education, and we're going to build a clay pizza oven in that school over there, and we just thought we might borrow a little straw. Would that be OK? Uh, the guy looks at me, you know, and, and I could see from his face there can be no other explanation. <laughs> However, so plan, plan A was working out, kind of. However, we get, and this is my car, we get to school and we discover that we can't actually build it in the school. Um, can't remember why, but we couldn't. So we had to build it so that the, the, the mother said, well, well, we'll go to our home, which means now I've got 70 children, half of them from a Jewish school, no longer where they're supposed to be, which is in, an, in, a, in another school, in doing a home visit. So in terms of Jewish Arab space, Arab Jewish space, you know, this is even, this is even more profound a, a movement because they are now in somebody's home. But they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about making the clay pizza oven. But back to plan A, there's a slight glitch in plan A. The grandmother won't let the children near the clay. Why not? Well, because she says, I, I, I want to make a pizza oven. They'll just muck it up. <laughs> I said, well, but that's the point. <laughs> They're supposed to be learning. They do. And here it is, a lovely Peter oven. <clears throat> uh, our friend who took this photograph said, it's, it's rare that you can take the photograph of somebody kneeling next to their dream. <laughs> we also do religion. Not everything you need to know about Judaism or Islam or Christianity, but what is it about your religion that you love? The charm of it, the joy of it, the things. So in order to show it, you, you, you think about the artifacts that you would like to show the other people. So here are the Jewish children working, um, and here are Muslim children working. Um, in the activities, we usually visit a synagogue and a mosque and a church, although mostly we work with uh, Muslim children. So here uh, you can see uh, the, the rabbi and the imam. The rabbi is opening the Torah scroll. Now, the Torah scroll is a sacred book. And he's saying, I'm going to open the, the place where we keep, keep our scrolls. I'm going to open the scrolls, and I'm going to ask you to come and look at these scrolls. So you, are, you, have, you don't really know that much about rabbis, uh, but you... You know, you've heard the rabbis make nasty speeches, you know, against Arabs, or you've heard the imams make nasty speeches, you know, against Jews. And suddenly here you are in that space being welcomed by a rabbi and an imam. And the imam is saying Islam is not a religion of violence. Slam, salam, means peace. Anybody who kills in the name of Islam is not 
as far as I'm concerned. Not even a bad Muslim isn't a Muslim. This is powerful. It's what you want to hear, of course, but when you hear it in the space, it enables the children then to, to enjoy the space, to feel the, the calmness of a mosque, the quietness of a mosque. Um, the rabbi will show the children the name of God. He'll say, look, take this marker, uh, point in the Torah scroll, this is the name of God. It's the same God, everybody knows that. Um, on, on, the, on the picture of the open Torah scroll on the bottom left-hand side, these, these girls have come from a, a Palestinian refugee camp in eastern Jerusalem. So imagine that, Palestinian refugee camp, welcomed by a rabbi, looking at the holy book. These are moments that you cannot take away. Funders are always saying, how do you prove success? I say, well, look at this photograph. They say, no, no, but how do you prove success? I say, I don't have to prove success. I, I, I know success. It, 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 it's not that these children won't be influenced by all the terrible things that happen after this day, but it is that they will know that for this moment in their lives, they were welcomed by people who they sometimes feel hate them, who they sometimes feel are hostile to them. You can't take that away. Um, or these prayer carpets. When they bring their artifacts, they have to bring the story. I'm a folklorist. Uh, um, they have to tell the story of the artifact. This prayer carpet was brought home from Mecca by my grandmother who made the pilgrimage on the Hajj 10 years ago. This um, um, wine goblet was given to my parents by my great-grandfather when they got married. Um, this kind of story. And here, I'm sorry, Amy, but it's, it's, again, not a very good picture of you, but you can just see Amy's back there as she's getting ready to go into the mosque uh, with the other people. <clears throat> um, and we'll do family history. Family history is really good. Family story, I call it. I don't call it family history. It enables people to talk about things that they wouldn't ordinarily talk about, but, you know, like, where have they come from? And, and that the other people care, they're interested. We don't do dialogue with children, because children would just reproduce what they see on the news or, or they hear at home, and it, often what they hear at home is not what you want them to tell each other. So, so uh, I, we don't do that. But once they've come to know each other, and this is the second year of the program, they are interested in each other's stories. They want to know what their lives look like. So this is entirely different. And if the children, uh, the let's say the Palestinian children have come from a, a, um, a village which is now deserted but you can still see, the, the Jewish children are thinking, ah, well you know what, we never put people in those buildings, we just know it as a wrecked village. That's the way in which history comes alive, it's also the way in which children come to understand that parents and grandparents lived through this. Again, subtext, you too are living through this. You too are making history. You too have a place. You can make a choice. What you do with your what you do with your days. If you're nice to each other, that's very different than if you're not nice to each other. <clears throat> um, and we make exhibitions uh, of ourselves being together. And those exhibitions are put up in school foyers, or sometimes they even go, you know, to the municipality. Funders like them, of course, because it shows that you're doing real things. <clears throat> Um, and relationships. Well, we, you have to be careful with children. You, you don't want shy children to feel that because they, they haven't got a friend, the, the program has, has failed. Because if the program fails, what fails? Coexistence fails. So you have to tell children, and we do, although you might think that you're going to find friends, that's wonderful. If you do find friends, that's great. But what we want you to do is to see into each other's lives, get that window into each other's lives. We want, you, we want you to relate to each other. We want you to feel comfortable together. If you get a friendship, wonderful. But don't use friendship as a marker of success. However, friendships do uh, evolve, and there you see these little girls, they waited for each other every joint activity, and they gave each other presents, and they wrote each other notes. Um, the parents, while the activity is going on, will talk about the situation. They're eager to talk about the situation. They'll talk about uh, their hopes for their children's education. They'll talk about the problems. They'll talk about the stupidity of politics. They might even argue. But they're arguing or talking with people who they know care. Because they've seen, you've seen how I work with your child, and I've seen how you work with my child. I remember once, uh, I saw this, I was called, uh, um, someone called attention to uh, um, a Palestinian woman 
um, who was sitting on the ground by herself during one of the joint activities, and she really looked something was something was going on so I went over to her and I said is everything okay you know c can I get you something what c can I do and it was as if you know uh, a, a sort of trance was broken and she said no 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 Simon I'm just sitting here looking at the way that mother that Jewish mother is teaching my child she said I never thought I'd live to see this <clears throat> um, so friendships do happen these two boys are talking about um, they're talking about what they're going to be studying in their high schools. Uh, and the guys, uh, one of these guys is uh, actually a member of our board. Uh, you know, we have a great active board. Uh, and, you know, he, they're, they're having a chat in one of the activities. Um, and there are relationships between communities. The, the one pair of schools have been together for, tw for about 22 years. Uh, and a number of years ago, they decided to create a, a, an end of year community picnic. So here you are. It gives people who work and haven't had a chance to come to the joint activities to come, because it, it's in the afternoon, on the weekend, Friday afternoon. They come, they share food, they dance, they enjoy, they watch their children play. Uh, and some of those people created a cooking club in which they went to each other's homes and they taught each other how to cook and of course they ate. Now here they really did discuss the situation um, and they really got into very heavy and very positive conversations. Um, so we're talking about people finding themselves in spaces that are not considered safe. Of course they are safe, we wouldn't take them there if they weren't safe, but they're breaking they're breaking frames within their own heads and they're finding themselves feeling comfortable. Um, what they don't know and what you can't know and what we often don't know is what's going on behind, around the situation. So here <clears throat> we have people in a public park, we love to use public parks, make a presence in a public park, you know, Jews and Arabs together. That's <laughs> and it's, it, it seems silly, but it's such an important thing to see. Um, so here we are making dolls, but what you don't know is that every one of these families is touched by the violence. That's the situation. You know, they know friends of friends of friends or somebody in their own family has been killed or something's happened. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that we sometimes find out about and sometimes we don't. It's what is the undercurrent in the, in, in the activities but doesn't destroy the activities to the contrary. It usually strengthens the activities, and it might be something nothing to do with Jews and Arabs. This grandfather here um, wanted to talk to the children before the activity. That's a bit iffy, because you never really know how a parent or a grandparent is going to hold uh, uh, children, and you don't want the children to laugh at him, but I, of course, said yes. And he said, you know, children, when I was your age, I was in the concentration camps, and um, I had scurvy because there was no, no fresh things to eat. And I swore that if I ever get out of this, and I didn't think I would, I will, I will have sauerkraut every day because I love sauerkraut, he said. And I can tell you, I have had sauerkraut that I've made every day of the rest of my life. Um, now, the children um, came quietly, and the parents, and they asked him questions during the activity. You know, you mean this isn't a myth? You mean this stuff really happened? What was it like? Um, it's a sad thing about this photograph, if uh, those of you who've read David Grossman's books, so um, the, the, on the right-hand side, far right, this is David Grossman's son, who died a few years ago uh, as a soldier in Lebanon. And David Grossman himself, of course, was very against that war um, and would not uh, allow the government to come to the funeral. <clears throat> Um, what you don't know, so you've seen this slide before. What we didn't know was that the day before the activity, a home in this village was destroyed. It wasn't destroyed because um, the parents or the family were considered to be terrorists. Um, it was destroyed because they didn't have the correct building permit, which was su surprising because the government wasn't issuing building permits in a place where they clearly should have been able to build. So bulldozers came in, the home was destroyed. They watched that from, their, from the school. The child from the home um, wasn't able to come to the activity. And after the activity, I said to the headmaster, you know, wow, how, how did you come to uh, accept the, you know, the, the guests coming? I mean, how did that happen? How did you know we would be safe? Um, and he said, because the class wanted it to happen. The boy wanted it to happen. His family wanted it to happen. Everybody in the village wanted it to happen. And what the children said was, 
These are not the same Jews. The people who are coming to visit us aren't the people who, who, who knock this house down. But please do tell the children. And of course we did. We told the, the Jewish children what had happened and the Jewish children were amazed uh, not because they hadn't heard about this, but because, you know, it's that thing. They, they said, you know, we've seen these things on television, but it never occurred, you know, th th we never thought people lived there. You know, it, it, it's so simple. How, what, what you don't think about, the way in which the news isn't something that you think, ah, you know, yes. But these children, having encountered each other, now that's what they're thinking about. So that's what's happening to them. Um, or this grandfather, who I discovered was knifed on his way to the uh, western wall of the, uh, of, of the um, temple, you know, in Jerusalem, on his way to pray on a Friday. And I said to his grandson, um, uh, your grandfather came? And he said, oh, yeah, yes, yes, said, yes he came. Um, you know, I, he, I did my homework, um, and he, was, he loves pickles, and I just told him in passing we were going to the Arab village, and he said he had come. And I said to him, Granddad, how can you come after what happened to you? And he said, if I don't come, who will? <clears throat> um, so again, this is not political, and, I, and I'm not saying whether this is right or wrong. I'm just showing you the security fence, as it's called, or it's called all sorts of things, separation wall. Um, uh, I'm showing you because this is the children's reality. Um, this is what they see. And here is another example of the security fence. And as you can see here, uh, it definitely cuts. It, you know, it goes in between a neighborhood. You know, it, in fact, cut, cut off one of our headmistress's uh, homes from her brother's home. You might ask yourself, well, and I did, how can you carry on doing this work? And she said, well, one thing's got nothing to do with the other. We have to, we have to make a difference here. You know, if we don't make this difference, nobody else is going to do that. This is our work, Simon. Um, and then the checkpoint, which you can see at the bottom of the slide, is the checkpoint that those Palestinian girls go through to, to, um, on their way to school. Sometimes they get to school, sometimes they don't. You know, other parts of the reality. This boy here um, on the left, uh, um, <clears throat> the, the far left, his name was uh, Benaya Zuckerman. Now, w we have the fortune of of working with one of the schools where our children go. So this boy is our uh, middle child. She's 28, I think. Uh, not good with numbers. Um, and um, when they were 18, he was blown up on this bus. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, since he's my daughter's year, you know, he, this is a kid that we also knew personally very well. Um, well, the children of, of that age well, the school, basically, the high school closed down, you know, it was, it was but, the, but the children came to school um, and the kids were, were given the library, so they were in the library most of the time. Now, it just so happened that that week um, we had planned an, a, a, a number of joint activities where the Arab partner school was coming to visit. So we said to the, the Jewish principals, you know, how do you feel about this? And they said, now is when we want them to come if they want to come. The Arab principal said, now is when we want to go. They sent these brachot blessings, these condolence letters, which you can see, uh, and they came. As the, ch as the Arab children entered the schoolyard, um, just a little bit beforehand, some of Ben Ayar's contemporaries came out of the library and they sat just along the pathway. They didn't say anything, but they, their presence was a marker of just how important it was for them to see the Arab children coming to their school as a normal, natural thing. Don't forget, these children had been in the program. If you can build these things right and you keep them running long enough, children grow up expecting to do what their brothers and sisters have done. So while a child is in the program, an individual child, for two years, their families might be in the program, because families in the Middle East tend to be quite big. They might be in the program you know, for 10, 12 years. Um, so these kids had come out and it was kind of a, an un, unarticulated welcome committee. Um, <clears throat> we brought the exhibition of this boy making dolls, and that's what you can see the children are looking at. The teacher was a teacher then, 10 years ago, she was, she, she was a teacher, and many of the kids saw their, their brothers. So the Nayar becomes uh, somebody who the children really know, um, or if they don't know him, they feel that they know him. This reaching across, this movement forwards, this, uh, 
uh, transcendence that you know the human spirit can do uh, often when you least expect it um, but you work you know you work for this it doesn't always come but when it comes the impact is huge um, these are our hopes our graduates growing up here is the little girl at age nine playing her, the same mother but wearing different clothes playing seven stones so this little girl grew up and as a 20 year old 21 22 23 year old joined us became a, a member of our organization they often say they'll come and they'll volunteer and i say i don't want you to volunteer i want you to work i want you to learn what we do i want you to learn how we do it and i want to pay you which means you're going to have to do it well you're going to have to do it properly um, <clears throat> Uh, or um, the top photograph. These two girls were actually friends and they'd visited each other's homes as children in the program, found themselves, the uh, Palestinian young woman is a teacher in one of the schools we work with, uh, and the Jewish young woman is a member of our staff. <clears throat> um, and then one day, totally by surprise, this woman says in the introduction part of the joint activity, well, Simon, you might not remember me, but, um, Ten years ago, I was in your program. This is my son. Um, and uh, I, I, I told him, I just can't wait for him to grow up to, be, to learn what, you know, what I learned from you. What I learned from you, I carry forever. <clears throat> so we're grandparents. Uh, teacher training. We work in a teacher training school a college in the south of Israel, near, in Be'er Sheva. The teachers, student teachers, more or less do what the children do. Um, we're part of a program. Some people work on current events. Some people work on what is identity. We work on folklore. Uh, the, the students are as apprehensive of meeting each other as the children are, even though the Bedouin and the Jewish students uh, learn together in the same college. They don't believe that each other will really want to know about each other. But so, th because of various things that happened uh, in history over the last few years, many of the colleges have courses for the Jewish and Arab student teachers to meet each other, just to sit and meet each other. And let's change the atmosphere in our schools. Let's give our teachers something else. Um, this is a, 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 actually the, the chief Masorti, a conservative rabbi of England. Uh, his community has supported us for many years. Don't talk to me about funding, it's dreadful. Um, but this community has supported us for many years. And by support, what's more moving than the money, although the money is of course useful, um, is the way the community takes our work on in London visits us often, sends groups of, ch of, of youth to volunteer with us. And the rabbi is one of these people who, when, as often as he can, he comes to Israel and he meets, he meets the victims of terror. He meets people. He goes and he meets. And he's established this lovely relationship with one of the imams with whom we work. Um, and now these are the last two slides. Um, so uh, the week in which we were planning to come, or getting ready to come, you know, these terrible things happened. Jewish settlers moved into uh, um, uh, an East Jerusalem um, Palestinian neighborhood called Silwan, which reignited stone throwing and various things. And as a consequence of that, uh, a number of people have been driving cars into, into uh, people getting off the trains. You know, you might have read about this or not, a baby was killed. That just a few days before we came. I, I don't really understand that. You know, they don't even, the, the people who do that, I don't, it, it, a crowd getting off a bus is, is not a Jewish crowd. You know, they, they, they could be anybody. Uh, but a few days after that, a, a Bedouin school from the town of Rahat in the south came to visit the Jew, one of the Jewish schools that we work with. This is not our program, but the school considers the relationship a result of us having worked for many years in the school. Um, it's, why is it significant? It's significant because while all this new, new uh, violence uh, is happening after the, you know, after the war, um, the, the people from Rahat who suffered in the war because the they're, they're close to Gaza, and many of the rockets ended up, you know, over their head, or you know, actually in, in amongst them. Um, they're, they're, they are Israeli Bedouin, but many of them have relations in Gaza, so that they, in terms of, you know, what they're feeling, of course, they are totally uh, destroyed um, <clears throat> in, in, inside. 
And six months ago, the Jewish school had visited their school. So the question was, would the visit go ahead after the war? There was no question that the visit was going to go ahead. Um, so in terms of what do I bring now, I don't just bring sort of hope from then and let's, you know, maybe things will, will carry on being hopeful. I bring hopeful things from right now too, but I'm going to end with these two slides and if I can, I'm going to read something. I need a tiny bit of light, but I don't actually know if there's anybody here, so it's all right. Um, what you have on the top is, uh, and you can see the, the, the date of that slide because you can see King Hussein meeting Rabin. This is the time of Jordan. Now, just at that time, a bus was blown up in, uh, in Tel Aviv, um, and uh, um, the children in, the, in one of the Arab, thanks, that's great, children in one of the Arab schools um, <clears throat> And decided to send condolences. They call them blessings, brachot. Uh, they decided to send these condolences to the Jewish school. Um, and they, the, the point was, Simon, we, you know, I became a postman. We, we want you to, to bring these condolences, but you have to tell the, the, the sorry, you have to tell the children, um, we don't feel guilty about this. This is not our guilt. We didn't do this. But we do understand their pain. And we want them to know that we understand their pain. So one of the, one of the pictures is, a, is a, a, a bus with blood on it, you know, red, and a tree. And the, the caption says, I saw the news, I saw the blood, I cried. I plant the tree of, rem of, of, mem of uh, remembrance in Dizengoff Center, where the, where the bomb went off. Um, another one of these says, if peace were a mountain, I'd climb it every day. Well, I mean, you can't, it, it, you, you can't imagine um, uh, something so simple uh, and so uh, naive and so full of meaning. The bottom one is um, an exhibition that the children made together, um, Jewish now children, boys, uh, of themselves working together. Um, and what you can see is in the middle of the Hebrew, what the Hebrew actually says is um, um, life, Life is not um, all hatred, okay? Uh, and um, life is not only hatred. Uh, and then to the right, they wrote, all you need is love. You know, the Beatles, you know, kind of all you need is love. So this is my thinking about that. The children who created this poster understand all too well how the world around them has been shaped by a hatred that cannot be assuaged by singing all you need is love or even by the substantial work they and their parents and grandparents do together. Nevertheless, they have carefully chosen what to write. It is an indication of the hope they feel, despite the fears and anxieties they have grown up with, because they have been able to take advantage of the opportunity of being together and feeling comfortable in each other's space. The poster can be seen as a flag of their intention not to accept the situation they have been born into, but to take responsibility for their own vision of society. What I want to say is that these people, the Jewish and Arab, the Israelis and the Palestinians, the children, the parents, the grandparents, the teachers, the principals, the student teachers, our own team, these people, they are all at the crossroads. Folklore gives them a way of understanding a way of using their understanding, a way of believing that hope is a possibility. Thank you.